the thing that you're using now called the internet has become quite the thing over the years in case you haven't noticed. However, the internet that we know and possibly love today is quite a bit different than it was in the early days. In the mid 1990s, when home internet started to become more common with services like AOL and Prodigy offering dial-up services, the internet was a simpler place. For many reasons, it had to be a simpler place. Due to the hardware of the time and more importantly, the connection speed of dial-up, the web was optimized around these limitations. The result was a much lighter internet that was far more basic for better or worse. Things like streaming media weren't really a thing, but neither were the annoying autoplay videos and sites with built-in crypto miners, so pick your poison. In many ways, the modern web is bloated, but it has scaled well with advancements of modern hardware. What about old hardware though? Like, let's say something over 25 years old. Can you still access the modern World Wide Web in any capacity? Well, I happen to have a few old PCs around, so let's connect them up and see what happens. Before we begin, we need to devise a way to run a modern web browser on something so old. Obviously, a modern version of Windows isn't going to run, since they aren't even technically supporting CPUs from just seven years ago. So for this project, our best bet is Linux. Now, we are limited to what distros we can use, as most modern distributions like Ubuntu have lofty requirements compared to the PCs we will be using. Honestly, this makes sense considering hardware this old is more expensive or hard to find than just grabbing an almost free semi-modern Optiplex from some random office. But we need not fret as there are several options for a lightweight version of Linux with a GUI. We could choose Puppy Linux or Damn Small Linux 2024 or simply install Debian with a light window manager. Whatever I pick, I'm sure someone in the comments will point out that there's another option that might have been better, and you might be right, so feel free to share your thoughts below. However, I decided to use TinyCore, which is an impressively lightweight, internet-ready, bare-bone Linux desktop that runs on practically any hardware. I will be using the Core Plus version, which supports Wi-Fi as well. For the most part, this is a modular distro that doesn't really come with much. Even things like sound support are not enabled by default. That said, it has a nice little package manager that gives you access to all sorts of modern and legacy apps that can be added. One very interesting feature is that apps can be loaded directly from the cloud and loaded into memory and then wiped upon reboot. However, since RAM is a very valuable commodity here, I will be installing everything to local storage. Alright, so our first victim, or uh, PC, is my Slot 1 rig. If you've been watching this channel for a while now, you'll know that I use this test setup for DOS, Windows 98, and sound card things. To give it the best chance, I decided to upgrade the 233 MHz Celeron to a 333 MHz Pentium 2 and bump the RAM up to a max of 128 MB. So, by 1998 standards, we're running a pretty baller rig. With the upgrades complete, it was time to install. I went with the CD-ROM installer for Core Plus and everything went well without a hitch. After I booted into the live environment, I used the TC installer to get everything installed on the main drive. About 10 minutes later, I had a fully functional Core Plus install running off my CF card. The system takes about 3 minutes or so to start, but once it's up, it's fairly responsive. Since this system has USB support, to connect to the internet I used one of these toilet paper link N150 USB cards. And it just works with the included utility. Wi-Fi 4 on a Pentium 2. Who'd have thought? So with our 26 year old system up and running with internet access, what can we do? Well, one obvious thing we can do is use Telnet on PuTTY to browse some bulletin board systems and play some door games. There are ways to do this on older systems as well, 
but it's a pretty decent way to do it considering how easy it is to set up on a modern wireless network. Additionally, the TC Package Manager has a few graphical web browser options to choose from. The one best suited for this system is probably Dillo. As you can see, Dillo here renders web pages in a way that, well, would make Internet Explorer enthusiasts feel right at home. Jokes aside, it loads quite a few modern web pages and the word almost readable comes to mind. Pages like old Reddit and Wikipedia are surfable and load images with a degree of speed you wouldn't expect from a PC from the early 90s. Still, it's a rough experience. The good news is that we do have another option, which is NetSurf. This one is another light browser like Dillo, but it seems to render things in a way that actually look like web pages. Unfortunately, this system is still far too slow and RAM starved to use it properly and I got lots of crashes and had to task kill it a few times. So as far as this system goes, we are pretty much at its limit. Most modern web browsers require more advanced instruction sets, specifically SSE and SSE2, to even run at all. So, although I can technically install the latest version of Firefox on Core Plus, it's not going to work on a Pentium 2. So how about we move to something with a little bit more power? Whoa, 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 whoa. Not that much power. So this is my Compaq Armada E500. I used to use Linux on this way back in the mid 2000s and I remember streaming YouTube with it using Flash Player. It wasn't fast, but it did work, so I'm curious to see how it stacks up now. Compared to our Pentium 2 PC, there are quite a few improvements here. We have a Pentium 3 running at 900 megahertz and double the amount of RAM with a total of 256 megabytes. This CPU also supports SSE, which might help us, I guess, maybe. As far as upgrades, I decided to swap out this old tired drive with a CF card adapter before I installed Core Plus. This drive has been clicking and on the verge of death since I did that Windows Me video on my other channel years ago, so it's time for it to go. Like before, the installation of Core Plus was swift and problem free, and yet again I used this wireless card to keep things simple. Right off the bat, I notice a large difference in speed of the OS itself. For a PC that is effectively only three years newer, it's amazing how fast tech was moving in this time period. NetSurf, as I mentioned earlier, runs much better here than it did on our previous system. If you don't load anything too intense, you can use it to navigate simple websites without too much stutter. And we even get ads on Reddit, which clearly is an improvement. If we push the envelope a bit further, we can install the non-SSE2 version of the Firefox-based browser CMonkey. For many reasons, this browser is a mess on this system, but if you avoid sites that are too demanding, it loads them fairly quickly. Make no mistake when I say demanding websites, I'm talking about sites like Amazon or eBay, not something like YouTube, which pretty much crashes it immediately. And just to make sure that no other browser is magically optimized for the Pentium 3, I tried a few other ones and it's pretty much all the same story, unfortunately. I can't help but think with just a little bit more RAM, this system might even be able to stream some media, but as it stands right now, I think we're going to have to move on to a more powerful system. And a more powerful system we have. This is the Dell Inspiron 6000 a media powerhouse from late 2004 with blue glowy media buttons. This system is loaded with a Pentium M running at a blistering 1.6 gigahertz with 512 megabytes of DDR2 RAM. Surely this will be a great browsing experience. As expected, the increase in CPU speed does provide a better experience. The best browser I found in this system was Vivaldi, of all things. I managed to use it to stream music off of Bandcamp and run 144p YouTube at like 3 frames per second. This is the result. 
impressive. Okay, so it kind of sucks. Also, it thrashes the disc a ton, which leads me to believe that maybe more RAM would help. So I decided to throw a little bit more RAM at it and see what happens. I'm not sure what the max of this system is, but I was able to get it to boot with 1.5 gigabytes of RAM. And this was a game changer. In addition to it being able to stream YouTube at 360p at an acceptable frame rate, the disc thrashing and crashing issues went away almost entirely. Since I was feeling confident in my newly upgraded system, I also decided to install the latest Firefox, and it works, mostly. Although YouTube and streaming media don't seem to work due to what I assume is a codec issue, browsing is surprisingly snappy. With this amount of RAM, we might even be able to install a more modern distro, but for the time being, I'm pretty happy with the results we have here. This experiment is a good example of the rapid evolution of hardware between the late 90s and early 2000s. Just the fact that the release dates for these devices are roughly three years apart, yet they vary so much in terms of capability, is quite interesting to me. Well, that concludes the video for today. If you found it interesting, maybe consider subscribing, as I have more content coming out on similar subjects all the time. And on that note, I'll see you in the next one.